this is what we call a centralized exchange where we have one single point of failure. In this case, the bank would be the single point of failure. These sort of things would happen with the central exchange where the banks would impose certain restrictions on you. The community would then vet the project. They would see, okay, this project doesn't look like a scam. Okay. So you can just invest $1 in an Ethereum node now and you can just get the passive rewards. Hello everyone, welcome to the crypto show by Coins Capture. Today we have Sarthak from Zebra's web. Welcome, Sarthak. Thank you, thank you, Malcolm. Thank you for having me. So, Sarthak, uh, let's start with your journey. Tell me how you started in Web3. Uh, tell our audience about it. Sure thing, yeah. So, I think uh, I've been in the space since 2016. So, this is basic, basically when I went to uh, pursue my higher education in uh, finance and innovation in Sydney. That's when exactly I fell into the Web3 community and the crypto community. I started trading um, cryptos back then. Um, started developing a liking and start sort of uh, dwells myself into the entire tech space of crypto. From there, we started this company called Demo, which is a parent company. So I'm the CTO and co-founder of Demo. Um, so we started initially assisting different uh, uh, different dApps and different layer ones and layer twos and now layer zeros as well with ecosystem development and block propagation services essentially making the entire system a bit more faster, making the blocks a little bit more steady, and also, of course, uh, dwelling into the whole, whole uh, developer communities and growing the ecosystem. From there, cut short to now, uh, we also do have our very own uh, incubation hub. And today's call, I would love to explore one of the projects that um, we have built in-house, which is called uh, Zebra Swap. So uh, let's let's start with it. Uh, so, like, there, there is misconceptions about tech, centralized exchange, decentralized. So let's discuss about it. Like, what are the major differences when it comes to a centralized and a decentralized exchange? I think uh, you know anyone listening to uh, this interview definitely should just take if they can just take one thing away from this. It's essentially a centralized exchange. Uh, let's assume that you know it's, it's like a bank. So you put your money in the bank. Let's say if tomorrow the bank uh, goes into a loss and the bank decides, you know what, we, we're going to stop operation. That does mean that you are losing your funds as well with the bank. So this is what we call a centralized exchange where we have one single point of failure. In this case, the bank would be the single point of failure. In that sense, uh, your funds are in the custody of a bank. Now, a decentralized exchange or a decentralized economy works very differently. In a sense where the decentralized exchange is a non-custodial uh, entity. That means I am myself, I'm the user, and I myself hold the funds on this exchange. So if tomorrow, um, you know, let, let's say if the decentralized exchange even shuts down the operations, I still don't lose my funds because the decentralized exchange don't have access to my funds, whereas a bank would have access to my funds. So that's the key difference between centralization and decentralization, where centralization, you know, has one single point of failure, where decentralization divides itself into multiple points of failure, where not one, if let's say one pillar falls down, doesn't mean that uh, I'm going to lose my funds. Correct, correct. So, uh, if you have seen after 2021 or 2022, there is a, a large number of users are uh, switching from centralized exchange to decentralized. The DEX is going. What are the reasons? Like, mm -hmm. just the the centralized entity is one thing. Like, uh, the market has changed. How is it? I think there's a couple of reasons involved in that. Um, number one reasons, you know, I think uh, according to me, according to a lot of data as well, is uh, with centralized exchanges, you know, the fall of FTX where losers, uh, users uh, sort of lost a lot of funds. There was Mongot's fall and there was, there was, I mean, tons of tons of exchanges that, you know, uh, were falling left, right and center. So users got a lot of their funds drained out from the exchanges. Even though the exchanges did promise that, you know what, uh, we will give you your funds back. But, you know, that that's a whole entire long process and it's just a really huge uh, impression that you know comes with these central exchanges. On the flip side, our central exchanges do offer one really good thing, which is the user interface. So as a, as a non-crypto user, anyone who would want to get into crypto, their first instant, first stop would definitely be a central exchange. However, once they start using the central exchange more and more and more, they would start realizing that the fees are a little bit high on the central exchange. You need to give your KYC, you need to share your private data. And also, then there's a lot of tax implication that also comes with the central exchange. So I think a lot of users from around the globe uh, just want to skip that implication, just want to skip the KYC, don't want to get in the government eyes. Because, of course, it is not a regulated space. 
So that's why a lot of users are migrating towards uh, a decent direction. Yep. So yeah, with the centralized, I think uh, the regulation is one major thing which it comes uh, that is still not regulated right now. With that also, uh, the non-custodial thing is booming. Like uh, if people are, are looking into like having their assets in their own custody. What are your thoughts on? Now, I think one hundred percent. So um, it's something like where we write down, you know, as, as a as being in the crypto community, our core focus should be to educate these users that your funds should be your funds and your funds should not be someone else's funds. So n no one else in the world should have access to your funds. So just, just I think uh, just recently there was a huge, uh, you know, debacle with a Canadian bank where users weren't able to withdraw more than $5,000. So I, th I think these sort of things would happen with the central exchange where the banks would impose certain restrictions on you, even if it's your money. Whereas a decentralized exchange doesn't, you know, it, 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 you can do whatever, whatever you want with your money, because it's your money at the end of the day. But with then there are challenges, and what, what do you think? What are the major challenges when it comes to non custodial Because, uh, uh, the transaction fee is one part. I would say that that we can mm -hmm. consider for different chains. There are different. Uh, with that, what, what are the major challenges in this? So I think major challenges with the uh, decentralized exchange or DEXs um, are number one is um, the user journey itself. So a lot of people don't know how to install MetaMask, how to you know get your private keys on a MetaMask. The private key essentially is like a is like a password, yeah. and you have to save that password. And if you lose that password, then you basically lose your account. So that's one thing where we need to you know promote and we need to educate the users that this is the right way to go. Do not share your data with you know, these uh, big corporate giants and with these centralized exchanges and those sort of things. Because at the end of the day, you are the product because you are sharing the data with them. True. So uh, still, I think, uh, does the user experience uh, play a major role when you said like centralized exchanges that uh, good user experience and everything? Mm -hmm. why, why we are still uh, not, I would say, we're still facing the same thing for Dix. We're not getting the specific user experience. To... No, absolutely. So I think user experience, um, I personally think it's one of the key principles of, uh, you know, getting Web2 users into Web3 users. So um, if the user interface is complicated, anyone would just leave the platform. So I think that there are, you know, right now Dexes are in the infancy stage. I mean, a little bit more than infancy stage, I would say. So with, with Zebra as well, that, that's exactly what we had in mind. So what we've done is we've exactly mimicked the interface of a centralized exchange. Wow. So it's really, really easy for anyone to understand, but the back end of it is entirely decentralized. And so you 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 are also building a uh, Zebra, right? Yeah. Tell us about what, what are the differences, how Zebra Swap is working, which different from other days, uh, decks. Mm -hmm. Sure thing, yeah. So, uh, you know, one of one of the points I just mentioned is one of the key reasons we want, one of the key aspects we wanted to focus on was the user interface and the user accessibility. So we've made it really, really, really simple and really, really simple to understand. So from like a let's say a twelve year old to a six year old should be able to understand the platform. So that that's exactly what we wanted to do. Another one of the key factors what we have is a multi routing system. So uh, there's this thing on Dexes which we call a slippage. So slippage is when, uh, let's say, I, I want to trade, let's say, USDT to Ethereum. And that so what's going to happen is that contract is going to try to execute my order. Now slippage comes in where there's a little bit gap and the price increases. So that, that's when the order fails, but I still have to pay the gas. So that's when the slippage sort of comes in. So with Zebra, what we've done is we've minimized the slippage to practically 0.2%. So how we've done that is uh, we've deployed a multi-routing contract system. So what usually happens is when a user comes to Zebra, if the DEX of Zebra swap will first check if the internal pools have enough fund for the swap. If the internal pools don't have enough pool for the swap, they then move on to the biggest DEX on that chain. So let's say Ethereum, the, 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 the order would then reroute to Uniswap. Let's say if Uniswap also doesn't have that fund, which is not likely, but let's say if it does, then it will move to a central exchange and then tap into that liquidity. So this this way, basically, we guarantee a 0% uh, auto failure. Understood. 
so so it's 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 a com- combination of taxes the existing one is also and mm-hmm. plus you uh, get liquidity from central agency is it correct that is correct okay. that absolutely correct yeah and then one of the main things the on taxes yeah, yeah oh sorry go ahead no that is fine you see yeah, so one of the main things on dex is also what we've seen is um there's a lot of uh, rug pulls so rug pulls in crypto usually means scam so there's a lot of scam projects on dex is right so you don't know which project is trustworthy which project is not so again what we've done is uh being decentralized we wanted to do a community driven system so the community driven system works in a way where uh we have a decentralized on chain uh, voting mechanism so let's say today if um, i have a token called uh, let's say sarta token and i want to list that token on zebra so first i have to put a proposal to the community the community would then vet the project they would see okay this project doesn't look like a scam only then we'll we'll uh, sort of say okay to uh, list them and once the uh, again this is all uh, on code is all on smart contracts so as soon as the community says okay you know what we have 51% votes saying yes and 49% votes saying no so 51% votes then will automatically list the project on the platform so it's not like that anyone can come and list you need to be verified you need to be verified on chain through the blockchain via the centralized voting mechanism so that is interesting like uh, so for example if i have a token and a uh, coin uh, and i have list it on zebras so it goes through a mechanism where the voting is done by the company i'm not that's correct yeah so yeah so essentially what you need to do as a project holder is you just need to come on zebra and apply for the application is a pretty straightforward thing where they'll be ask you for your twitter handles your name if your docs are not docs um your smart contracts and those sort of things then we have uh, some technical specialists in the community as well we have some community specialists so what these guys do is they will see the smart contract they will see if there's any sort of backdoor in the smart contract they'll see if there's any sort of scam in the smart contract because of course normal people can't read code normal people can't understand this sure, sure, sure. so then the community would then say okay we think this project is safe for users to invest in and once that happens only and only then the project gets listed on zebra that's that's a interesting thing like giving back the yeah. bonus to the uh community the community yeah 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 yeah, yeah. that is one and which all which all the chains you support are like how is it right so um again so one of the main usps for zebra is we've done a universal evm contract mm-hmm. so universal evm contract works in a way where we don't have to deploy on one chain it works with every evm chain okay so all we need to do is just uh, add the rpc in so rpc is basically like a url um for chain you just add that in and uh bang then the changes goes live got it got it got it so yeah so it's more it's it's the backend part right so for example if any new yeah. has to uh add on so it's an evm based chain and anyone has to connect to mm-hmm. is do you do it automatically or they have to come come to you how is it so again same thing so let's say if there's a new blockchain that comes up the chain says you know what we want to integrate with zebra swap uh they then would go ahead and list the proposal if the community says okay this chain looks legit um then it just takes 2 minutes for us to integrate any chain so then we just simply go ahead and integrate it so that is that is something like uh if you have to have any chain or any token everything mm-hmm. uh, is uh verified by the users and the com- as that's correct yeah and how that's correct what are the what are the regulations how how the regulators uh play a role for the taxes and how is it in india in abroad how is it so i think right now taxes are still a little bit in the gray area um we don't have a lot of regulations <coughs> excuse me yeah so we don't have a lot of regulations as such for taxes i think for you on the user point of view um the users are just supposed to technically uh um, you know just state that okay i have invested let's say 10 dollars in a dex through a dex and i got a 15 dollar return so technically they're supposed to declare that in the tax statements that's the right and legal way to go for but a lot of people what we've seen is they just do not do it they just uh, try to avoid these uh, tax declarations okay so again i would say uh, till we don't have some clear regulations i would advise anyone to just sort of go the legal way and just you know just put that in the tax declaration that 
yes, you have been trading in decentralized uh, assets. But yeah, until we don't have clear regulations, uh, we'll just be in the sort of gray area for now. Plus, uh, I think uh, the best way is uh, staking and farming uh, options also, right? So, till that is correct. Yeah. What, what, and what yield you are giving, how is it? So, so again, um, so because we are a universal EVM contract, so what usually happens is, um, let's say I just want to invest uh, $1 in Ethereum for staking. So now if traditionally, if I want to stake Ethereum, I need 32 Ethereums. So 32 Ethereum is about, uh, let's add a $3,000 price is about $960,000. So I'm not going to have a million dollars to invest for Ethereum. Yeah. So in, in that case, uh, what we've done is we've fractionalized that. So we've taken what we call is a one entire node. We fractionalized that through staking. Yeah. So you can just invest $1 in an Ethereum node now, and you can just get the passive rewards. And uh, like, is there any minimum criteria uh, to stake or like uh, a user can stake a $10 also? Can it, how is it? Yes, yeah, so anything for anything from $1 to how many, I mean, how much ever you want to stake. Okay. And that is, that is been uh, channelized through a smart contract or how? That's correct. Yeah. So everything is uh, decentralized. Everything is through a smart contract. So there's no admin functionality for us. So, I mean, there's nothing we are handling on the back end. Everything is routed through the smart contract itself. Well, that is amazing. and yeah, and regard yeah, and regarding the yields you asked. So again, um, certain nodes offer certain yields. So um, you could have uh, let's say Ethereum offering let's say three to five percent yield. You could have Ocean Protocol offering about twelve percent yield. Then you can have uh, and let's say Clay offering twenty percent yield. So it really depends on what asset you want to stick. Sorry. And that that's obviously you see the entire yield section uh, on the back. That's that's uh, great insights from you about decentralized exchanges and uh, Zebra Swap, the thing you're building. Right now. Uh, wish you a good luck. Uh, Thank you very much, Matthew. Yeah. With that, a closing thought for our users from yourself. So I think one, one closing thought would definitely just be, um, you know, we are still, as as mentioned in the infancy series, I think there's less than 2% world population that uses crypto, that uses the Web3 ecosystem. So we are still, still, still really, 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 um, you know, a small community in, in that sense. I would advise anyone and everyone, you know, to just uh, educate yourself about how custody works, how non-custodial services work. What is a DEX? What, how, how does it differ to a central exchange? And then you can probably, you'll be able to choose more wisely in that sense then. But I think education is number one key in moving forward for any any users. And with this platform, we are doing the same thing, like getting awareness. We are bringing new uh, topics every time and uh, bringing new guests so, so that every topic exactly. the, yeah. day, uh, the crypto and Web3 industry has been uh, covered. Thank you, man. Thank yeah, you for essentially. Have a nice day. Thank, thank you very much, Malcolm.